Hello again. We have been discussing the protocols for quality controls and uh, we have come a long way from where we started. We started off by talking about different kinds of distributions and the central tendencies. We zeroed down on the Gaussian or the normal distribution where the mean is equal to the mode is equal to the median. And then we talked about how the Gaussian can be employed to make an LJ chart to, for use in the laboratories. And then we talked about some rules and the applications of rules and the violations of rules. And then we talked about why these rules are important because it can detect errors. And so we talked about a few the kinds of errors that can happen in the lab and the reasons for it and some ideas about how to control those errors. And then we went on to making the right chart. How can you detect errors only on the right chart and if you make wrong charts then your whole purpose is defeated. And from there we went on to talking about a new quality control lot and how you can put the right numbers on the chart when you do parallel testing. And after that we talked about another concept in quality control which is your bias. Bias and how do you compute the bias and if you compute the bias and how we can calculate the total error. And then we talked about why even calculate the total error because total error calculations will help you set quality specifications and tolerance limits in your lab if you have the total allowable error also that you find out from the databases available. And we talked about different databases that can be employed to find out the allowable error want to use in your laboratories. So, all these points come under the internal quality control as per 15189 clause 5.6 that is ensuring the quality of examinations. And there is one more concept in this 5.6 internal control that I would like to talk to you about. Yesterday I told you about when we calculate bias this is not mandatory as per NABL rules as of now. So, all those concepts starting from bias, total error, total allowable error and what we are going to talk about right now sigma metrics, these are all concepts though not mandatory that you may want to understand and think about in your laboratory whether you want to employ these things because these are good concepts that will enable your laboratory in set specified quality. So, we go into the final concepts that we will talk about in the internal controlling policies that that is called the sigma metrics. This is the fifth generation quality control and we will see what sigma metrics means in the laboratory. All of you would have heard about sigma metrics in some context or the other. So, what is Six Sigma? It is a 19th century mathematical theory but now used in today's mainstream business world through the efforts of an engineer at Motorola in the 1980s. One of the foremost methodological practices for improvement of services and manufacturing. And why do talking about sigma? Because sigma emphasizes the need to define tolerance limits to describe intended use. We will understand what tolerance limits is in a little while. That is a goal of Six Sigma for world class quality. Provides a uniform way of describing quality in terms of sigma scale and a sigma metric QC selection tool included in the CLSI C24 A3 guidance for statistical quality control for quantitative measurements. There are manual tools as well as computerized programs. We will see a manual tool in this presentation. So, what is Six Sigma? To bring operations to a Six Sigma level, bring down the number of defects to less than 3.4 defects for every million opportunities or occurrences. That means if you are doing 1 million tests in the lab, if you make only 3.4 mistakes, you have achieved Six Sigma. So, that is a big order. So, you understand the significance of setting the tolerance limits. How many mistakes are you letting yourself make? So, how do you get to that point? You get to that point by providing methods for systematically identifying and eliminating errors. That is what we have been talking about all this while. How do we have error detection programs like internal control programs? We have 
talked about many mechanisms of controlling your operations and then one more thing that you need to do is you have to define your quality specification that is setting your goals you need to say that i'm going to be at least four sigma or five sigma and in which operation and you have to strive towards that that is what we call quality specifications and we talked about one of the mechanisms of quality specifications yesterday that is by setting uh, the total allowable error as a parameter to stop that is your you say this is how much errors i am going to make I have, to, I have to confine myself to the allowable limits. That's one mechanism. Another mechanism is setting goals through Six Sigma. And so this way, the we already talked and saw this slide many times. You've got your LJ charts. You've got your bias detection mechanism. You can take it together and then you can understand your total error. And that is the mechanism that we have been talking about. So back to what are some quality specifications? Total allowable error that we just talked about. You set your goal as. TE will be less than TEA and second is sigma metrics can also be used to define the tolerance limits. DPMO is defects per million occasions or opportunities. So if you look to a conversion of DPMO to six sigma, we already said that if you make less than 3.4 per million operations, then you have your quality of your standard is laboratory standard is six sigma you have got a 3.4 defects you have a six sigma there are these scales which tell you the conversion if you make 1350 1350 mistakes per million operation you have got a 4.5 sigma so you can just compute that table i've just put parts of it here you have a 1.8 sigma which is not an acceptable sigma that means you're making 3 lakhs and 82000 mistakes per million operations so now while we are talking about it you just imagine the quality of your laboratory how many mistakes would you be making and what is acceptable is a 1.8 sigma acceptable can you make 38 3 lakh 82 thousand uh, mistakes per million operations will you let that be one of the things that your lab is doing so when you are looking at these numbers immediately you are thinking of tolerance limits I am not going to tolerate this kind of an error. 1.8 sigma is not acceptable to me. 4.5 sigma, maybe I can consider. This is where you need to make a call about how you set your tolerance limits. Let's look at some of the sigmas that have been put up in the Westgard QC site. And it says sigma metrics of airline safety, it's 6. Will you get into an aircraft if they don't offer you that kind of safety? very unlikely so that is a six sigma operation airline safety so they have to make sure that every nut and bolt is in place and nothing is missing and every operation is perfect but when you come to airline baggage handling maybe not that good 4.15 but you can uh, still deal with it you are okay about 4.5 so it's 4.15 it's roughly about we said 1500 or so errors per million operation we may accept it Departure delays, 2.3, not acceptable. Would you like sitting around in the airport lounge for uh, whatever time without flight arriving? So all these things have been set there to say this is the tolerance limit and maybe these, the departure delay, they have set a tolerance limit 4.5 and not been able to attain it. So at least you are working towards it. That's what kinds of graph tell you. Come to the lab. Pre-analytical sample is a 5.1 sigma in Westgard estimate. Wouldn't think that would be the case in our country at this point. And we need to actually set the goal and work towards it. At this point, I may put it like 2.3, 2.5, it may be what we are at now. So we have to set our goals and work towards it. And Himalaya specimens, 4.1 and control exceeding limit but that is within our laboratories if, when you are doing controls we have only attained up to 3.4 sigma okay that is a lot of errors and we are talking about some really good standardized labs at this point to talk about 3.4 and in our case we are just beginning to make these efforts into quality control so we really have to set our goals and work towards it i'm taking that 3.4 figure from the previous slide control exceeding limit 3.4 now how about your lab 
We are going to take that figure of 3.4 sigma, estimate that that is the number of errors that we are making. We could be making much more than that, but let us take 3.4 as an example here and convert it into the number of defective reports that you could be giving per day. Average load per day, I am assuming, is 1500 patients in a medical college laboratory and per patient you are doing 5 tests, again an estimate and total number that way will be 7500 per day. And so total tests per year will become 27 lakh and 37,000 per year which will convert to 78,351 defects per year. And if you did take it on a daily basis, it's approximately out of your 1,500 patients billing and to 7,500 tests being done, you are releasing roughly 250 reports if your sigma is 3.4. So, is that even that number acceptable even assuming your sigma is 3.4 which may not be which could be much lower. So, is that an acceptable number is something that we need to think about and do you want to set a goal for yourself and work towards that goal is something that we have to consider. So, now we are going to talk about the technicalities of finding out the sigma in your laboratory for every analyte. Understand it is not a laboratory which is having a sigma, it is an analyte. And if it is an analyte, it is even if you have got a two clinical decision levels, you are running quality controls in a high level and low level. So, sigma has to be understood for both these levels so that you will understand the performance of that analyte at whatever clinical decision level that you are able to calculate that for. So, when you are talking about Six Sigma, it is the most technical view, this is again from the Westgard site. So, the total, you are assuming your Gaussian is here. So, remember now, think back and remember your Gaussian. You are assuming your Gaussian is here, which means your mean is the target. You have no bias. You are assuming your test has no bias and you are assuming you have got a very well rounded, very controlled Gaussian with acceptable standard deviations and if there you can accommodate six standard deviations in each side of your mean. So, your Gaussian even if it shifts six times, you still are within the limits of allowable error. So, that is what when you say this is a six sigma performance. I will just reiterate when the bias is zero and the SD is narrow enough that six standard deviations will fit in the negative and six standard deviation will fit in the positive regions between your mean and the total allowable error limits, your performance is six sigma and your DPMO is just 3.4. So, coming back to that again, this is how you set your limits. So, total allowable error, I hope you remember, total allowable error has limits, the lower and higher limits, we saw that yesterday. You set your negative limit here, lower end of your total allowable error is here, higher end of your total allowable limit is here. Your Gaussian is standing right in the middle and your mean is the true value, there is no bias. Your standard deviation is really good, really controlled, your imprecision is very, very little and if you have, you can accommodate six standard deviations on either side of the mean this is your Six Sigma performance. So, to get a Six Sigma, you need to have your bias really controlled, your imprecision really controlled to have a Six Sigma performance and therefore, your DPMO is now only 3.4 per million operations. So, there should be some way of calculating it is. It, even if you do not understand the theory of it, it is fine. You can go into the calculations of it. Sigma is equal to total allowable error minus bias divided by ST. If you are calculating it in units, you can do it also in percentages, we will talk about it now. At this point, I want to stop and uh, tell you one thing. We have talked about calculating the bias, calculating, now calculating the sigma and might sound a little overwhelming. So, you really do not need to, these are very simple calculations, all you need to do is you have to find out your CV percent or your ST and understand your bias that is very important thing that is something which you get your peer group data about. So, I am saying it once again when you are getting your internal quality control program, please make sure your IQC provider will give you the peer groups data so that that bias becomes a very 
key element everywhere. To calculate the bias without the true value or the target value, you cannot really do it. So this is an important thing because you really cannot go forward from your LJ unless you have some kind of a peer group support. So this is again something I am reiterating. Get your um, peer group data. So if your peer group is there, you can calculate the bias and you know you can take this SD and CV, whichever out from your uh, LJs and then it's really easy to calculate. and. And all these calculations can very easily be done on the QC soft, the software which is on this uh, website. And all you need to do is just put in the numbers and for the TEA, define where you're getting your TEA from. What is your uh, source? Where did you get it? Did you get it from the CLIA? Did you get it from, uh, from BV values? Just that and even if you don't enter, it is not a mandatory field. You can get the numbers. You understand your performance. So it is important that if you can get started on this, it would be nice. You will know where you stand in terms of quality. So once again, the calculation of sigma is equal to total error allowable minus bias divided by standard deviation. So look at this this graph. Already that there is this much of bias has built up. Now this is one standard deviation, two standard deviation. It has already taken up four standard deviations here and the graph can only shift maybe one more time before it comes to the upper end of the allowable limit. So this is also another calculation that we can do. This is called critical systematic error. How much can your mean shift? How far can your mean shift is a very important question so that you know that you have to hold your mean in certain position. You have to avoid your biases. You have to correct your uh, systematic error. So these are the important factors that you can calculate. I'm not talking about the critical systematic error in this video, but the labs for life, uh, there is a module which is on the site, QC module volume 1 and in that we have more explanation about critical systematic error and I would suggest whoever is interested will please go and read that. So I'm continuing with just the sigma calculations here. Sigma is equal to either TEA in units minus bias divided by ST or TEA in percentage minus bias percentage divided by CV percentage. So both can be done. So there are two examples we have given here In this is a CLIA proficiency database for um, total allowable error, glucose it says either target value plus 6 mg or 10 percent, whichever is greater. So I am using the 10 percent value here and assume your bias percent is 5, which is your observed mean is 190, target is 200. So the difference is 10 and minus 10 that becomes absolute number 10 and 10 by 200, which is a 5 percent is your bias and assume that your CV is 3. So by this formula 10 minus 5 divided by 3 is a 1.67 sigma which means it's a very poor performance. 1.67 we saw much earlier it's making into lakhs of mistakes per million operation. So this is an unacceptable sigma. Look at the CV here. CV is good and the, even if the bias percent is also not too much but that is enough for you to violate your acceptable ranges because you are going with the database that has been decided using the criticality of the parameter and using the PT reports. We talked about it when we were uh, talking about how these people have defined the total allowable error limits. So and the CLIA has defined it in a certain way after a lot of research, 10 percent is the total allowable error. and If you use that calculation and see your sigma, you should be having better quality in your laboratory. And look at the numbers, they don't even look alarming to you, 3% CV, you would think okay that's fine and you're looking at a 5% bias. When you're putting these together and comparing it with the total allowable error, you find that you're actually not doing too well. Another example is this is in units for potassium, here the potassium target value plus or minus 0.5 and so assume the bias is 0.3. And the mean is 6.3, the target is uh, 6. So finally in the calculation you will see that you have got a 4 sigma performance which is a good performance. So you will say oh that's good. So I maybe I can improve but at this point I will not worry about my performance. So I might worry about my glucose performance. So this is how you uh, evaluate your performance by sigma and then setting your tolerance limits. So now how do you put sigma to work in your laboratory? This is a question uh, that we have to answer. There are, I already told you about there are two mechanisms. One is critical systematic error and the calculation of critical systematic error is very easy. It is sigma minus 1.65. It's a 
easy number to come to but the concepts are little different and there in the module please read through that and also the second important is to find rule selection guidelines so now i'm coming back to our original concept that we talked about while we talked about our lj graph that you can use your rules as single rules or multi rules so now you would want to understand in which parameter can i use these as single rules or just one rule where do i need multiple rules so that can be done if you know your sigma because there are certain tools available which will direct you to this is the group of rules that you may want to employ to arrive at your quality if you want to arrive at a 5 sigma or a 4 sigma you may want to take a few rules together and employ it in your laboratory to safeguard the analysis of this parameter or that, that parameter okay so this is a, a table which uh, I would direct your attention to. If your sigma metric is less than 2, the method has unacceptable performance. So remember your glucose, unacceptable performance and does not meet your requirement for quality. It is not acceptable for routine operations. You might want to drastically take some measures to change the whatever you are doing. And if your method has if it is 2 and 3, this is a marginal performance. You might want to do more controlled runs per day and you want to have well-trained operators, reduce rotation of personnel because whoever is trained, it would be good for that person to be in charge of that operation and more aggressive preventive maintenance, careful monitoring of patient test results and continual efforts to improve method performance. That is 2 and 3. You can still do it but you need to have really good mechanisms of safeguarding that analysis. If the sigma metric is between 3 and 4, the method has fair performance and meets your requirement for quality and can be managed in routine operations. This method will require multi-rule procedure with 4 to 6 control measurements. We will talk about it all these things. For 4 to 6, it is good performance. More than 6, it is a very good performance and can be managed using just one control if that is how, uh, if your regulatory requirements will permit you using only one control. We have to now, at this point, before we understand how we use that tool, let us understand a little more about making an effective QC design for your lab. An effective QC design will ensure performance for by quickly detecting medically significant errors, PED, remember that term, PED or percentage of error, error detection should be more than 90 percent and it should generate few, very few QC rule violations when there are no significant errors. It should not flag things unnecessarily, your good QC protocol should not flag things unnecessarily so that you have to take corrective action when they are not required, you have to reject runs when they need not be rejected. So, the percentage of error detection should be more than 90 percent, uh, your false rejection should be less than 5 percent. The third point is that you should have the fewest number of QC runs to enable the economics of it, the, you have to save, you do not have to waste your QC material, reagents and consumables, make it the minimum number of runs, the optimum number of runs and meet regulatory and accrediting bodies requirements. That is also an important thing because NABL if it is asking for two levels of control for a certain number of patients, that is a regulatory requirement if you have to look for NABL accreditation. So, if a very high sigma like 6 sigma technically will not need you to do more than one level of control. If the NABL regulations require you to do two levels, then you, you have to comply with that. An effective QC design again will have medically important errors will be detected. This is reiteration. You should be able to detect medically important errors more than 90 percent of the times and the if 90 percent of the error detection cannot be provided by a single QC procedure, then multi QC procedure should be used. So, again one more last point here is one to us rule should be avoided, minimize the waste and reduce cost. 1, 2 S important that you do not take it as a rejection rule. We talked about it in the initial uh, the West Guard rule uh, presentation. But the, again I reiterated, if you have only one level of QC in your laboratory, 1, 2 S should be a rejection rule. But at this point of our discussion, we have come a long way from where you can just say that I have only one level of QC. We are assuming you have got multiple levels of QC, bi-level or tri-level as required as is recommended and 
that is how this discussion is progressing under the assumption that you have got the enough QC material in your laboratory. So now the rule selection as per method performance and the two key points that you will keep in mind is percentage of error detection and percentage of false rejection. So these two should be kept in mind. The error detection should be more than 90 percent, false rejection should be less than 5 percent. You can use many kinds of tools for using multi rules. What we will discuss here is the power function graphs for sigma selection. This is a CLSI recommended procedure. Also there are the easy rules which Westgard has suggested and OPSPEX tools are also available. Some of them are available online, you can check those out. And before we start on talking about the power function graphs, we need to understand two more concepts here, the N and the R. The N here is very close to the NL rule that we talked about earlier in our uh, discussions on the Westgard rules. N here also represents the total number of control measurements that are available at a time decision is made. Example, if two levels of control measurements are available within one run, N is equal to 2. If 3 are available, N is equal to 3. It is simple to understand. Like for a bi-level control, at one point you will have an N of 2 and a trial level you will have an N of 3. But what if that analyte performance requires you to look at a 6x rule or a 41s rule or a 31s rule for which you will need more number of measurements than what is ordinarily available. Therefore, if a 6 x is to be followed by an analyte and you need 6 data points and you have only 2 levels of controls then really you will have to run it three times. So that is what your n is, the number of data points which should be available at one instance when you are reviewing your quality control before the starting of your test. And R on the other hand represents the number of runs. How many repeats of n are required? If you have to repeat the 6n like two times the R will be 2. You will see again when you are looking at the power function graphs that we will talk about shortly. So now look at the power function graphs. These are power function graphs for two level QC. These are for three level QC. And what are power function graphs? We will come to that by as we discuss. And we are looking at the uh, details of the power function graph. On the x axis, you have got sigma at the at, at sigma scale is given here 1.5 sigma, 2.65 sigma. 3.654 up to 5.85 sigma it is depicted on the power function graph and at the x axis on the lower side we have the systematic error critical systematic error which is actually sigma minus 1.65 for 1.65 sigma you have got a critical systematic error of 0. So it is the same thing you can either go by sigma or you can go by critical systematic error, we will talk about going by sigma. On the y axis, you have, you can detect both the percentage error detection and the percentage false rejection. This is your false rejection. At this end, this lower end, you see how much each of these lines will show us percentage of false rejection. And the upper end at point 90, you, since you are going to look for a 90 percent error detection, you are going to check this, these graphs at this line to see where it is cutting. I will tell you in a minute how, to, how we are going to do it. And there are 8 power function graphs, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 power function graphs intersecting. All of them intersect at some point in this or this graph. And right hand column shows the rules to be followed, applied. These are the rules that you need to follow in certain situations, in each of the situations. And so, we will let us see the details of it. I have got a bigger version of it. So, once again, I am going, this is your sigma scale. This is your systematic error. This is your percentage error detection that you, you, you want to see what is a percentage of error detection. At this point is where the error detection has to be checked. And this is your percentage of false rejection. And false rejection is also in this column here, assuming this is a set of rules, false rejection is 0.07 percent. So the false rejection is set below this line. And now you are looking at the power function graphs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 
these are the eight power function graphs that we talked about all of them start from this point of false rejection and it goes up and cuts the 90 percent line 90 percent error detection line at some point so you have to now align your sigmas to where these are cutting the 90 percent to find out what set of rules should be applied for a particular sigma so let us look at a few examples you have a four sigma performance here you have a five sigma performance here and you have a three sigma performance here let's start from the five sigma the five sigma graph the five sigma which is the graph which is cutting in this one is your graph number seven for a five sigma performance you need to apply only a one three s rule in your uh, analysis it has no false rejection and your n should be two and your r should be one it's as simple as that that is how it says if you have a five sigma performance for your maintaining the quality all you need to do is one one three s and with the one three s rule in two control levels two controls and with one run so that is enough so that is if you have a good analytical performance what about four if you are looking at the four the four is cutting this graph four sigma performance is cutting this graph and if you trace this graph you will see that it is the graph number three therefore you will follow the set number three rules this is the third set rule this is the first set second set third set and the third set says i have to follow one three s 2s r4s and 41s so when automatically when you say 41s you should have a n of 4 to have an n of 4 you should have an n of 4 to get an n of 4 whatever number of runs it is required you have to do that many runs to make an n of 4 I hope you understand when you have the performance you look at the power function graph and you see where that graph is intersecting where your sigma requirement is intersecting which a power function graph and that is this is the key and immediately you will go to the key oh mine is intersecting three three so i'll go to the third group of rules and i'll follow the third group of rules look at the three sigma three sigma when you see the three sigma doesn't have any power function graph intersecting it at 90 the best you have is somewhere here at 82 percent this is 80 percent so slightly more than that 82 to 83 percent is your best bet for a six three sigma performance the best error detection is about 82 percent and for that 82 percent i have to follow this rule set of rule number one which means i have to follow one three s two of three two s r four s 31s sex all these rules will have to be followed for me to keep that analyte under control so that's a lot of rules and you have to do the n of 6 with an r of 1 has been recommended because to have a 6x you have to have 6 measurements at one go otherwise how will you know the 6x unless you have 6 readings when i'm looking at that thing in at 10 o'clock today morning to decide whether I should accept or reject the run. If I have to follow a 6x, I have to have 6 readings. Therefore, n of 6 is required. So, that is how you decide on your quality program. How do you do the program? How do you decide on which analyte requires what kind of supervision? So, if these things should be made known to your both your frontline staff, and if it is not possible, like this kind of a supervision has to be done on a daily basis by the supervisory staff this you can probably hold for once in a week so there will be a real need for close close monitoring of all these whenever your sigmas are low up until about 3.5 even 4 you may need multiple supervision so you need to decide on which analyte requires what supervision and that has to be put down in your protocol till you attain the goal when you can actually move the goal this is again an objective it's setting your quality objective is sigma is where you try and set that objective and move towards that achievement of the objective and then once it is achieved you can step down your uh, number of supervisions and all that but up until that point this has to be in the protocol so this is your 90 percent error detection so we already talked about all these where this graphs cut the 90 percent graphs number seven here and this is for the five sigma and you said this is a graph number three which is cutting for the four sigma and there is nothing cutting on this one so you are looking at a suboptimal performance 
you are accepting it because that is the best you can have. This is the N and R. So now to recap about the rule selection, different lines represent the power of the different QC rules and the different numbers of control measurements per analytical run. We already saw that. These QC procedures are identified in the key at the right side. We saw that the power curves from top to bottom correspond to the control procedures listed in the top to bottom. This is just explaining how to look at the graph. Now something about rule selection. In situations where the power curves for two different QC procedures are so close they are hard to tell apart as in graph 3 and 4. In these situations the user should select whichever QC procedure is more practical to implement. A single rule may be preferred over a multiple rule if that is if you are able to monitor it adequately. A minimum of n of 2 may be required by regulations even though n of 1 QC procedure may provide say the same error detection. In the graph above it does not provide for an n of 1 all these situations are talking for an n of 2. But there could be situations when you are doing extremely well because it is only 5.65 sigma we are stopping here. In an extremely situation even if you can have an n of 1 if NABL is requiring two controls then that has to be followed. Now another recap, this is from recap from the very early videos that we discussed about and I am going to bring it forward to the place where we are discussing now. We said that the power of daily monitoring, when any point exceeds 3s limit a 13s error you take stop and take corrective actions. And then if there is a 2, 2 s error, stop and take corrective actions. If two levels of control exceed the same 2 s limit, stop and take corrective action. If one point in the group exceeds 2 s limit and another exceeds minus 2 s limit, which is an R 4 s, this rule is to be applied only within run. Because n must be at least 2 to satisfy the clear QC requirements, all these rules can be applied within a run and in the case of T2S across run materials also. So this is uh, the power of uh, having a daily monitoring system. You are empowered to look at a 1, 2, 1, 3S. You can look at 2,2s, R4s and all these are possible only if you have two control material available and this is how you can monitor your system on a daily basis power of daily monitoring. And then across run errors the power of periodic review, your peer group all these are your power of the periodic review. Look for systematic errors like 2,2s, 3,1s, 4,1s, 70 and all these rules. Look for trends, shifts, emerging populations and look at the peer group mean SDCV and CVI SDI. We will discuss it in the next video. So all these things will give you the power of periodic review. And then there is a power of the multi rules then that is actually you are looking at power of uh, daily monitoring plus the power of periodic review. Then for a few steps keep that to keep in mind. You use all data systematically, monitor daily periodically, get CVs, SDs, get target data, get the from the peer group, get the total allowable error, arrive at a sigma or a SCC, set goals, select rules and follow rules. Once again the power of uh, periodic review, the advantages of multi rule QC procedures are that false rejections can be kept low while maintaining very high levels of error detection. This is done by selecting individual rules that have low levels of false rejection then building up the error detection by using these rules together. I know this is a very complex topic and uh, uh, this probably will not be enough for you to understand all the concepts. The further reading material should be referred to to understand how to use the multi rule. CLSI guidelines are available which will guide you through the use of the multi rule using the function graphs. And when a sigma is low, this is again recapping, when the analyte shows less than 4 sigma, the lab must take special care to do risk analysis and all these things should be kept in mind. Statistical measures are using of multi rules, looking back to the previous runs and increase the number of QCs, increase the R in number of runs of QCs and non-statistical methods are staff with special training to be deployed 
for the low sigma test and increase the number of supervision. So, there are statistical methods as well as non-statistical methods. We talked about this mostly about the statistical methods, how to, you need to increase the run and the NCs and looking back and using multi-rules. These are all the things that will enable you to safeguard that analytical phase when your analyte is not performing well. And developing an optimum QC plan, define the quality that is needed for each test, know the performance, CV bias, get target. This is completely recapping what we have already been talking about. Get target values, TEA from the best possible source, calculate sigma metric, decide on the rules to be applied on each analyte from the rule selection power function graph, whether it is a single rule or a multi rule and decide the number of control measurements and define explicitly the application and interpretation of rule within and across materials. Interpret multi-rule to help indicate the occurrence of random and systematic error. Train your staff, set up daily and periodic monitoring schedule and assign responsibilities. And to conclude, the discussions on the internal quality controls, your stable monitoring system using internal quality control will safeguard a potentially unstable analytical system if you understand all these things that we talked about and implement them adequately. Thank you.